reading from the book of Revelation. I, John, saw another angel come up from the east, holding the seal of the living God. He cried out in a loud voice to the four angels, who were given power to damage the land and the sea. Do not damage the land or the sea or the trees until we put the seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. I heard the number of those who had been marked with the seal, 144,000 marked from every tribe of the children of Israel. After this, I had a vision of a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation, race, people, and tongue. They stood before the throne and before the Lamb, wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, Salvation comes from our God, who is seated on the throne, and from the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and around the elders and the four living creatures. They prostrated themselves before the throne, worshipped God, and exclaimed, Amen. Blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honor, power, and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders spoke up and said to me, Who are these wearing white robes, and where did they come from? I said to him, My Lord, you are the one who knows. He told me, These are the ones who have survived the great distress. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the first letter of St. John. Beloved, see what love the Father has bestowed on us, that we may be called the children of God. Yet so we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. We do know that when it is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope based on him makes himself pure, as he is pure. The word of the Lord. Dominus Fabiscum. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Matteum. Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he had sat down, his disciples came to him. He began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. Verbum Domini.
Dr. Benjamin Weicker's been here this week making some more Saints and Scoundrels program. He's here this morning. And uh, he has a PhD in theological ethics, so he's always been interested in thought and the impact that thought has on actions and on peoples. So in this series, there's a contrast between, in one series, Edith Stein and Friedrich Nietzsche. So Edith Stein was a brilliant philosopher who eventually became a Carmelite nun. She was martyred in a Nazi concentration camp. Friedrich Nietzsche, whom she is speaking, you know, they're discussing their different philosophies and thoughts, was an atheist that had such an impact on atheistic communism. It ended up destroying his way of thought, led him to insanity as well. So it destroyed himself, it led to the destruction of many other peoples. And the series that's currently airing on EWTN is a discussion between St. Maximilian Mary Colby and Joseph Goebbels. Joseph Goebbels was the propagandist for Nazism, and so he riled people up. He got the machine going in so many ways through using the media. And whereas Maximilian Kolbe became this instrument of charity, even, even in the horrors of the concentration camp in Auschwitz. In fact, there was one event in Maximilian Kolbe's life where there were those in the camp, the, the concentration camp, who were talking about how they were gonna get the Nazis back. And Maximilian said, hate is not creative, only love is creative. And even when they became like animals because they were so hungry within that camp, Maximilian was sharing his meager amount of food. He takes his place for a man who was condemned to the starvation bunker. And within that bunker, he le leads the prisoners in prayer. He hears their confessions. He holds them as they're dying and blesses them as they are dying. He would be the last to go. But the point that I believe Dr. Weicker is trying to bring home to us is the impact that our way of thinking and our way of life has, not just for ourselves, but how it impacts whole peoples for good or for ill. And so we leave where there's an interdependence that we have on one another. We know this materially, right? Because the food that we eat today, probably most of us didn't grow most of what we'll eat today. Others grew it, transported it, sold it. We drove on asphalt roads that somebody laid. We drove in cars that somebody assembled. And so materially, we know that we are interdependent but not just materially, but also spiritually and morally, that our lives have an effect on each other, a lasting effect. We leave a legacy. And so we celebrate today the lasting legacy of the saints. These remarkable men and women, the luminous trail of the saints throughout 2,000 years of history who led these remarkable lives that led now to their glory in heaven, but also that impacted so many other people, just as St. Maximilian Kolbe did as well. And that we think about that too, about ourselves. What is the legacy that we're leaving behind? And how we are living our life makes that difference. We heard in today's first reading from the book of Revelation Salvation is from our God. This is what they're singing, this praise they're singing in heaven. Salvation is from our God who is seated on the throne and from the Lamb. So these men and women throughout history led these remarkable lives because this salvation came from God to them, because of the grace of God that they corresponded with in their lives, because of the love of God that was alive in their hearts. 
Last night I had the vigil mass at St. Francis Xavier just down the road from here for All Saints Day. And I pointed out to the parishioners that there's a stained glass window of St. Francis Xavier. And so light comes through those stained glass windows. And the saints were those who both received that light that came from God, that light and love, and they embraced it, corresponded with it, but also that light came through them. They were transparent, if you will, to influence and impact others, bringing the light of God's grace and light and glory to others so that they too might follow the Lord. And so that is our call as well, to be those saints that who are both receiving that light, that salvation that comes from God, who is seated on the throne and from the Lamb, corresponding with that in our lives. And when we do so, that's the very best thing that we can do for others, for the world. We leave a lasting legacy for good or for ill. And it is for us then, in corresponding as the saints that we celebrate today so well did. You know, one of the things that I think James and I especially like is that we hear about their wearing white robes. White seems to be the color of heaven, so we're happy with our white hair and beards. <laughs> that white is this, this color of, of innocence and purity and glory and light, and that is the, what they're wearing, these white robes in heaven. These are the ones who have survived the time of great distress they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. <clears throat> then Jesus points out that uh, the reward of those who have persevered and those who have even suffered persecution for his sake, their reward will be great in heaven. It's going to be greater than we can even envision in our own minds. You know, there's a beautiful little story that I'd come across. I always like to read it on the solemnity of all saints because I think it tells us something of what awaits us. It's a story about a priest. It's a true story about a priest who had given a parish mission. And he was exhausted after giving this mission. He said he felt a little bit sick. And this woman in her late 20s comes up to him and wants to talk to him. And he didn't know if he could bear one more family problem, one more trouble to hear. But he reluctantly agreed to hear her story. And she began to tell him about her nine-year-old son who had died of leukemia the year before. And her husband couldn't deal with the illness. And so six months before the boy died, he left the family. But the priest says, the woman isn't telling me a tale of misery. A different kind of story emerges. Toward the end of his life, her son told her, Mama, I like it when I fall asleep. Because every time I go to sleep, I go to be where Jesus is. There's light everywhere, and all the children laugh and play. Each night, her son told her more about the land of light where Jesus lived. That world her son journeyed to in his sleep became, as he put it, more real than when you're awake. One night, not long before the end, her son raised himself up slowly and painfully from his hospital bed and said, Mama, I know I'm going to die soon. I'm going to be with Jesus and play in the light. She encircled his thin frame in her arms and wept, saying the only thing she could say, I love you. Don't be sad, Mama, we'll still be in touch. Someday you will be with me. He asked her to step back from the bed and bent down and bend down so he could touch her. He said, I live so much of the time where it's bright and where Jesus is, I'm going to touch you now and you can feel what it's like to be where the light is and where Jesus is. The nine-year-old put both of his hands on her head like a priest or rabbi giving a blessing. He held his little hands firmly on her head. She felt an indescribable brightness, a comfort, and a joy. Two days later, the boy died. Several times in the next weeks, her son came to her with the brilliance of a holy light around him, letting her know that he was okay. 
Our true homeland is the heavenly Jerusalem, our homeland which is in heaven. And a question for us to ask as we consider the holy men and women throughout 2,000 years of history is what would a saint walking in our shoes look like? In our circumstances, at our age, in our workplace, in our homes, what would a saint walking in our shoes look like? Probably for many of you, they'd look very much like you. And it is for each one of us to continue to be like those saints that allow that light of glory to come into our hearts, his light and his love, and to let that be our lasting legacy, the, the light of glory that we share with others, the light of love that we give to others. We celebrate all the saints in glory in heaven. And probably we know many of the saints who aren't recognized canonized saints. I can think of my own grandmother who often had a rosary in her hand who was just this gentle, beautiful soul. <clears throat> the Lord has um, revealed that light of his glory to us in so many ways through holy men and women. May we one day join their number. <clears throat>